Okay, afternoon everybody. Um, I was asked to come along to give um, the viewpoint from uh, somebody who's worked with a local group um, for quite a while now uh, as a, a member of a local trust who almost by accident bought a woodland nearly 20 years ago um, instead of Rupera Castle. The group that I belong to is Rupera Conservation Trust. I am as I say, one of, the, uh, one of the trustees since around about 2001. Uh, I came in as basically somebody that was reasonably good at doing accounts and, and was able to help them to uh, do the lottery fund returns just after they bought the trust and managed, uh, bought the woodland um, that we ended up with and, uh, and had ma managed to get uh, £180,000 worth of lottery funding um, to do some restoration work on it. Uh, Coid Cry Group Hera is a woodland which is within a triangle uh, of Newport, Caerphilly and Cardiff. So it's pretty much in the centre of those three, uh, if you treated those as the corners. It's well tucked away and up until the 90s it was um, a conifer plantation, as so many woodlands were. It had been turned into a con conifer plantation after having been an ancient broadleaf woodland um, which was owned by the uh, Morgans of Tredega, uh, Tredega House. And they not only owned Tredega House, but they also owned Tredega Cas uh, Rupera Castle, which was uh, just alongside the woodland. And the woodland had, up until the early 19, uh, 1900s, been uh, used by them as um, somewhere that they could have a bit of a playground. They had, um, without doubt, uh, game hunting going on up there. They used to take tea right up on the top on the Iron Age hill fort on the, uh, on the summer house that they built on the top. Um, and when we bought it, it had been planted with conifers since the 1920s, almost entirely, and felled in the 1990s, as I say, and left pretty much as, um, as our woodland manager used to say, as a pretty much blasted wreck. Um, so it's 62 hectares of planted ancient woodland, and there was a small amount of conifer stand left there to, be, to, uh, to, to mature, but all but 11 hectares of it had been pretty much clear felled. There were small amounts of broadleaf that were still extant in the, in the corners, and within the broadleaves, um, there were one or two remaining um, interesting species. So when we bought it, uh, we needed not only large amounts of money, but massive volunteer input to get it going again, basically restore it to a, a native broadleaf woodland and try and increase the biodiversity, not only within that site, but also within Caerphilly Borough. That is the woodland, um, and it's pretty much of a sort of lozenge shape in a, a really nice area, uh, surrounded by farmland and other woodlands, so good connectivity into other areas. Um, this is about 15 years after we'd bought it, so by then you've got a reasonable amount of regeneration and there's a lot of replanting that's gone on on there that you can't see, um, which is, is actually, this was taken in April, so they haven't come into leaf yet. But you can still see quite clearly on the right-hand side the amount of conifer that was left. Most of that is either already gone or is just about to go now in the next year or so. So native broadleaf woodland, as most of you probably know, has plenty of what they call ancient woodland indicators. Um, we've got quite a few of them there. We've got an awful lot more and on a regular basis we are still finding them. They pop back up now and again. One of the big problems that we always had was that there was an awful lot of work that needed to be done that we basically didn't have the money for after the end of the lottery funding in around about 2007. Um, we had a reasonable amount of money in the bank, um, but we needed to be very careful with it um, because we had a, um, obviously a long time to carry on creating this woodland. Up until then, we'd planted around about 25, 30,000 trees um, all broad leaves. Most of them were what we had been advised was probably <clears throat> there before the conifers. So uh, oak, um, there was quite a lot of ash that wasn't planted, it was already there. 
um, wild cherry, um, some hazel, but not a vast amount was planted in the first tranche. Um, however, we have planted an awful lot more since then. Um, they had not really thought about replanting hedges, but we've done quite a lot since then as well. Uh, we were working on the basis that uh, we were being advised at the time by experts because when the Trust bought it, most of them were more interested in Rupera Castle and the Iron Age Hill Fort than they were in the actual woodland, uh, although they were quite happy to buy it when they couldn't buy the castle because it went into private hands. Um, they, they were pretty sort of completely clueless as to what to do with 153 acres of overgrown garden. Uh, so, that, which was what a lot, an awful lot of it looked like with bramble and bracken and twigs everywhere. So, one of our main uh, things has always been volunteer input. This is a group um, who came up to help us with some replanting going back a few years ago in an area where we'd just taken some conifer down. Um, and we've relied on the, the volunteer group right from the start. We've had our volunteers and visiting volunteers to, to really sort of beef things up. Um, we did have money for contract planting. We did have money for restoring the, uh, the ancient hill fort, which you can just about see right up on the top um, of the hill there. If you look slightly to the right, you can see in the trees a little sort of, it looks a little bit like um, an anomaly, but it's actually a large stone wall, which, uh, which is the, the, what used to be the surrounds of the, uh, of the summer house. Um, so what we basically did with, with the various amounts of funding that we, that we started off with and we continued to look for was to use the volunteers to use that funding as usefully as we could um, and creatively. Um, initially we had funding for a woodland manager just part time. Um, when that money ran out in 2008 and that post funding came to an end, we've since then used contractors or ourselves to do the work. Um, but the volunteer group has been in it right from the start and I can't say, emphasise enough how important it is with this sort of project to get the local people on your side um, and that's not just the people that are going to come and do work on the ground, in other words they're going to come along and dig, dig holes and plant trees in them or help to put up fences or that sort of thing. Also the, uh, the people like the local horse riding groups, walking groups, um, we've had a rigs group up with us investigating Rupera limestone, which is only found on our site and just close to it. Um, and they help enormously in actually not only doing physical work on the ground, but also in when you have to put grant applications in, it's really useful to be able to say, and we've not only got 200 paying members who pay a small sub every year, um, to continue to support the local woodland, but they also come out and help us to, to do work. So volunteers are, are really the core of, of this trust. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was to create extra habitats on the woodland. One of the things it really didn't have was much in the way of, of water bodies. There was one stream on one side, one stream on another, and some wet patches. So we added a pond with some kidcoid funding, which we'd got. Um, this is around about 22 by 19 metres, so it was quite a large pond. And initially it was planted with the aim of maybe encouraging things eventually to come into it. And within a couple of weeks we had dragonflies and lots of birds coming down to, uh, to drink from it. And as it improved, um, we had planted and encouraged in native plants that were likely to be there. Uh, and we started to get little things like uh, palmate newts and then we started to get things like that, which is a great crested newt, which is absolutely fantastic. We knew that they were nearby. We were hoping that they'd come in. It didn't take long before they did. Of course, it now means that we can't do any work in that pond without having a licensed person on hand and, if necessary, an EPS license to do any work in it. The licensed person is on the left there, in the pond, helping us to clear it with one of our volunteers. Because within a couple of years, well, maybe several years, it had got pretty overgrown and we needed to start clearing the water body back a bit to leave a little bit of space for people to, uh, for, well, for people to see 
that there was still water in it and also for the wildlife to get to it. Um, so our volunteer group came in and they helped to haul out an enormous raft of bog bean that uh, had got rather over-enthusiastic. Um, and they basically roped it around, cut it off underneath, um, and then hauled it out bit by bit. Um, and that's the sort of thing that we use our volunteer group for. We also use volunteers for uh, some of our other species. We already knew right at the start that we had dormice in the corners. Um, the Vincent Wildlife Trust had reported that uh, to Subrec a long time before we were in the, in the site, um, almost as a sort of uh, sideline because just alongside in Rupera Castle, um, there was a colony of greater horseshoe bats and they also flew through the woodland. So as the woodland was recovering and the colony of greater horseshoe bats was also increasing, um, it meant that we were having more and more restrictions necessary on the amount of management that we were doing on the site. So uh, one of the first things that we got running was uh, a dormouse project. Um, it's a great thing for volunteers to get involved in. Everybody loves dormice, they're cute little tiny things, they fall asleep in your hand if they're not already asleep. And that was, I think that was taken around about 2006, just after I got my license to handle them. Um, they're great uh, as a, a sort of, you know, when you want to go around and show people what the woodland is all about, then you can put that up on the screen and people go, oh, absolutely fantastic, here you are, have a tenner. We do survey work and it's been ongoing since our woodland manager was in place in 2002 and the results have shown varying amounts of population over the years. When the woodland was really low uh, in vegetation and the new plantings were gradually increasing but were still pretty uh, small, the, the dormice were right out in the edges and there weren't that many of them that we used to record. These days the box numbers, having shown quite an increase for about 10 years, are starting to decrease. But we think, um, I'm absolutely convinced, having worked with these things since uh, 2006, that they are still present, but they are now using the natural habitat very much more because the site has not only got loads of natural regeneration on it, as well as the planted trees, but it's also got masses of really nice bramble, uh, there's loads of scrub, there's loads of woodland edge, and we find native nests, natural nests, instead of nest box nests. So I'm very doubtful about the reports that go around uh, across the country saying that dormice populations are crashing. It depends where you look. Some of the other surveys that we do, bats are obviously one of the important biodiversity indicators now. We have around about eight species, possibly slightly more, recorded on or near Rupera. We've got greater horseshoes as well as lesser horseshoes. We've got serotines, pipistrels, uh, both pipistrels uh, that are most common, and various other ones that are, least, uh, that are less likely to um, be recorded regularly, but are, are usually flying over. The odd Dorbentons, for example, now and again might pass over the pond, but you couldn't exactly say that they're likely to be resident because most of the water bodies are not where they want to be. And we also do um, bird surveys. These days it's a, a nest box survey that's done every year, but we originally had another volunteer group helping us, which was uh, the BTO uh, mist netting local group. And when they started uh, in 2002, they were very much um, getting great numbers. As the woodland changed, the numbers were changing and dropping, but the woodland birds are more common now by far, and the, the number of species that they recorded was around about 84, and we've now gone up to around about 90 plus. Uh, and this is just in 153 acres, but the habitat is very varied, so they are, um, <coughs> there's likely to be some there that we, we just don't frequently don't um, pick up on every year. And plants. We've been very lucky to have some good recorders of plants. Uh, most recently one of our 
local ecologist, who's an absolute expert, um, has got involved with us and he basically rewrote our original um, species list and increased it vastly. Um, the snowdrops there are probably a remnant from when the site was owned by Rupera Castle and was, it was probably uh, a few bulbs that had been spread from the, from the castle by the gardeners and they thought it was going to be nice. Um, but it's a spectacular site in the, in the uh, very early spring. And then we have uh, a good colony of wild daffodils, um, which there are only, to my knowledge, there are only about two or three sites for wild daffodils in, in our area. And I, we think we've probably got the largest colony. So the learning curve that I mentioned in my precy was that basically most of us knew very little at the start of this um, about how to manage a woodland, particularly a recovering woodland. Um, I think we've done pretty well, but from a, a, what you could call a standing start, just, just under 20 years ago, um, where the site was pretty much a very impoverished and uh, blasted woodland which had almost no biodiversity interest across 90% of it, um, it's now become a really fantastic resource for wildlife. It's also become a great resource for local people. Um, we have, as I said, got them really on board um, with us and they come out uh, quite frequently and let us know if there's any problems. Um, we'll, we'll get phone calls asking us for advice about how to manage their own land. Um, but we always uh, say that the, the big problem that we have with this uh, woodland, as with so many other um, pause sites, other woodland sites, and the species that we've got on there, are basically that if you've got a small fragmented woodland, um, then isolated woodlands are not going to be able to support a healthy population of species. They basically will uh, become maybe inbred, definitely they will, they will start to suffer because the habitat isn't sufficient for them to live in um, and they can't breed out. If you've got connected woodlands, it doesn't really matter how small they are, obviously bigger, bigger is better, but even if it's a small woodland, but it's connected to others by field hedges, by um, another strip of woodland or really close by, then that is going to be a massive benefit and most woodlands, as I'm sure that you're aware, Welsh Government is, is sort of acknowledging it now, woodlands need to be managed. You could say that ours might almost be at the point of being overmanaged sometimes because we keep poking around in there. But there's so much of it that we always ensure that there's plenty of it that is untouched. So safe for wildlife, safe harbour. Managed woodlands can also be quite a good commercial, no, I lie, they're not particularly commercial unless they've got conifer on them, but they can certainly pr uh, produce some fuel and other benefits. Education is one. Uh, if you can sell your woodland for, whether it's chainsaw courses or um, education in, in biodiversity, um, getting school groups up, whatever, that's all great. They're also great for the volunteer groups who come up um, and the walkers who come up and benefit from uh, the exercise. That's what I keep telling our volunteers. Um, whether they believe me or not is, is another matter. Um, but the volunteer element is essential. We always need more hands. Um, and we do sometimes get a little concerned because a lot of our volunteers are, have aged with us. So when they were in their 60s, they're now in their 80s. Um, one of them retired two years ago and he was 90, but he was still coming out and helping us. Um, and he's, he's now enjoying his retirement at long last. Um, but I think the main thing to say about any of, the, uh, any of these sort of projects is just how important it is if you're going to try and restore a, a broadleaf woodland from whatever state. It basically, get your local people on board, get the local people to understand why you're doing it, um, increase the biodiversity as much as you can and show that off to them as well, um, publicise it and, and basically 
try and look for as many grants as you possibly can um, that tie in with that, uh, with that sort of community thing. Because the grantors love giving money to people who do lots of community work. Um, and I see no reason to consider that restoring a woodland isn't also community work. I think that's uh, about my lot. But uh, if anybody wants to find any more out, then there's a website. Rupera.org.uk is our website.